we're back. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and you will not need coffee for this session, okay? It's fast paced, about 50 minutes, 55. We will have time for Q&A. If we don't get to your questions, we'll do our best to answer via email. It's my true pleasure to have Mr. Luke Van Dyke from Dedalan on the AI side, machine learning. He's a real expert. You'll enjoy his talk as well. And also Ms. Deborah Aubrey and Gabby Davenport from Intel with their new oh, just super capabilities with aviation, their airworthiness evidence package and really cool things coming up. You know, many times people think that things which are heavier than air cannot fly. Well, the birds did that, you know, millennia ago and AI, it is flying. We're gonna tell you about it. It's changing. There's so many dramatically accelerating changes in technology. Let's just dive right in, shall we? My name is Vance Hilderman with Effusion and this is our monthly series. This month, AI, machine learning, that land and Intel. Let's dive right in. First of all, let's ponder. Aviation processing power is dramatically increasing. You all know that. How do we cope? Well, the power is increasing, but the demand is increasing at an even higher rate, okay? What are we gonna do about that? Well, we have some interesting things. We can have better CPUs, multi-core. We've got Intel here, thank goodness they've got that solved and Gabby's gonna tell you all about that. But we also need special capabilities, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We have UAVs, pilots, with greatly increased situational awareness demands. But that means we also have optimized certification. Aviation is arguably, I don't think you can argue, but some people like to argue perhaps, but we think truly that aviation software, the certification with the hardware is the most rigorous in the world. So how do we combine CPUs, multi-core, AI, ML, oh yeah, all those aviation buzzards with certification? We need to do that. Let's dive in. First of all, multi-core, artificial intelligence, some quick facts. We need determinism in aviation. That means the same inputs can provably, remember, guilty until proven innocent in aviation. Same inputs, same outputs. However, AI, especially AI in the air, but AI on the ground too. Some people think maybe it's difficult to prove. Possibly there's potentially different outputs for the same inputs. Is it deterministic? Well, how do we certify it? Good news, Luke, Gabby, they've got answers they're gonna tell you. The key here is provable determinism, multi-core, advanced CPUs, certifiable evidence. Let's take a peek. Now, if we wanna think about this, we've got some unofficial and official guidelines with lots of documentation. They say it takes eight new Boeing 787s to hold all the documentation in that 787 for that 787. Well, what do we do about that? There's new guidance and rules, EASA, FAA, for multi-core, avionics hardware, AI machine learning. Airbus and Boeing, of course they're competitors, but they're also working together to promote AI machine learning. Several working groups, Tomorrow's technology, it is coming, but first we need to consider how do we ensure public safety in the air, on the ground, essentially certifiable determinism. Well, this aviation ecosystem is expanding. You've seen us for decades here at Effusion grow this little diagram. Look at it today. Those yellow highlights, determinism, see that? 4761A, the new A, if you're on the committee, the draft is out. You'll see our training get updated for the new A, but more evidence required from the air framers. And then 4754A, absolutely. We've got 4754B coming out later this year. We also have new advisory circulars. You're gonna see these coming out for AI, machine learning, but we already have them for multi-core, advanced systems, AC2193, for example. And then DO178, and 254, software and hardware. Both Luke at Deadly and Gabby at Intel are gonna tell us about their software hardware solutions for that to help us fly with AI. Now, this is the classic V model. If this were a 4754 class, many of you have been to a Fusion's 54 training classes, but you recognize this. 
This is the classic V model, top down aircraft system, subsystem and item, software, hardware, then bottom up verification, depicting from SAE, all of the various safety assessments that you have to do. If you need information on those, you can download free white papers at the Effusion website. But this is the classic V model that we have, but AI, machine learning, make things a little more interesting because we have to assure not just the end result, but the learning assurance process. It's a W shape. And fortunately, Luke Van Dyke here from Dental, and he's an expert at that. He's going to go into a little more detail on this. But look at this. That V model is modified. We have to first verify the learning process, not just the learning outputs. If we can't verify the process, how can we ensure determinism at the end? The answer is guilty until proven innocent. We can't. The V model becomes, you got it, the W model. Let's get used to that, the W model. Well, 4754, remember? We have planning, important red. It comes first, followed by development, aircraft, FHA, PASA, PSSA, the aviation English acronym soup, right? But the planning comes first. And then that development, the development of the safety requirements, design, implementation with those integral processes continuous throughout the project. And you remember the snake, the effusion snake. Well, now we include multi-core artificial intelligence. We have to verify the learning process starting with safety, 4761A, system requirements, aircraft, 4754A and B, and then develop the plans, traceability, CM, and we continue throughout the implementation learning with the AI as we go. This is the effusion certification snake, we call it, and it's green because that's the color of American money. If we do it efficiently, optimally, we should be able to save quite a bit of money on this, and effusion has the frameworks that support all of these things, and we'll learn about that later. Now, we do need checklists in aviation. All pilots know if you can't prove you did it, you didn't do it. So we need checklists for not just the plan standards and implementation, but also the learning process. How are AI machine learning? We're going to verify the outputs of that learning, bound it, ensure that it's ultimately deterministic in an aviation satisfactory way. So with multi-core, there's many ways to promote safe eye. Imagine one such way, we've got a deep learning network there, and we need to have acceptable learning. Perhaps we limit the behavior or we monitor the behavior, or we simply show on the ground, it can be deterministic and ultimately operate within a safe range, okay? That's the key part. Now I want to introduce you to Luke Van Dyke from Dedalea. He'll take it, and then Luke will introduce you to Gabby and Intel. We'll see their solutions to put it all together and make it really work with the silicon and the intellectual property. Luke, let me turn it over to you right now, and I'm going to turn off my video. I, I hope I didn't turn on my video too early. Uh, thanks, Vance, for having me and for organizing this and giving me a chance to uh, put our work uh, in, in the footlight. Um, my name is Luke van Dijk. I'm the founder and CEO of The Dalian. Uh, I created my company. Um, maybe we should have my first slide. You know, I think, Vance, you're in charge of the slide swapping. You hit the space bar. Thank you. Um, so, yes, this is my part. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, The Dalian, and we started, if I can have the next slide already, uh, six years ago with the idea that if you want to create uh, autonomous flight, if you want to have robots fly in the airspace as it is organized today and as it has evolved for over 100 years with you know, around the human in control of the aircraft, then you better be able to fly like a human and have the machine solve the type of problems that are currently solved by humans. Um, and some of these problems, like, you know, what I see here, you know, what does it mean, um, uh, are the types of problems that you can only solve with what is commonly called AI, but AI is really a marketing term, uh, but with machine learning techniques. And so that means that we have to prove that these machine, machine learning techniques are safe. And, and we have to work from requirements and then prove that these requirements are met uh, and that the system is fit for purpose and does not have unintended function that might be dangerous. 
Um, so that's what we set out to do as a company today and wanted to create the type of uh, AI machine learning that you can provably uh, safely put in the aircraft. If I can have the next slide. Thank you. So we started with uh, the human pilot in VFR. We took the CPLH skill test as a roadmap for what it is that the pilot actually does. And in VFR, uh, he or she uses his or her eyes to see primarily where you are, where you can fly and where you can land. So I could be the most important thing about flying. So we have uh, developed a system that uses uh, nothing but cameras that uh, can determine where you are without the use of GPS. You know, if you have GPS, great. If you don't have GPS, as a human pilot, it's not a valid reason to fly into the ground and neither will our system. Where can I fly means, you know, where are other people flying? Part 91.113 spells out that if you're flying VFR or IFR, if conditions are visual, each pilot shall remain vigilant and look out the window as the last line of defense uh, to not fly into others. And uh, landing is done by human pilots using nothing but their eyes routinely uh, hundreds of thousands of times a day in 50,000 airfields in, in the United States alone without uh, an ILS system, which incidentally uh, completely to the ground, uh, full touchdown category 3B ILS is a two human uh, operation. So if I can have the next slide. To solve these problems with a machine, we take a camera, we extract a high definition uh, picture, we run it through uh, some pre-processing, entirely classical algorithms that we can uh, characterize exhaustively. Then we run it through uh, a machine learned component called the convolutional neural network. Thank you, Vance, for your uh, assistance with the pointer there. Uh, and then it goes again into entirely classical post-processing algorithms, which uh, present, uh, which um, impose a time continuity and a, and a persistence of vision. So uh, this means that you know all these components have to be certified. And for many of these things, uh, there are ways uh, to do that. But let me first go to the next slide and, and, and show a bit more what the what the system looks on the inside. So we have our base system consists of four cameras. Uh, they go into a, a compute box, which we call the VXP, um, uh, which contains some standard I.O. It contains uh, an, an 11th generation Intel Core i7, or the CPU formerly known as Tiger Lake. Um, it contains some extra uh, FPGA logic to do some uh, more heavy lifting, and it contains a recorder uh, that can gather enough data to see that we uh, not only uh, have the last two, three minutes before the crash, but you know, have enough data to guarantee that the normal operation was in fact normal, uh, which is something I'll come back to later. We can have the next slide. Uh, so on this uh, CPU, the Tiger Lake, uh, formerly known as Tiger Lake Intel Core 7, um, uh, Gabby will talk a lot more about that in the last third of this uh, talk, so I, I won't uh, go into too deep. It's great because it's the first multi-core with this kind of performance that actually comes with the documentation to get it certified. So uh, it's not like we have a choice. This was We were super glad that this thing came on the market because six years ago, we were really scratching our head. And when Intel showed up with, uh, with this uh, package, we had one massive problem solved, meaning we did not have the problem that you typically solve with an operating system of portability. We're already happy that we have one CPU that we can use. Uh, we also fill up the whole uh, CPU with our and GPU with all our own code, so we don't have to protect ourselves against uh, third-party uh, uh, software of unknown providence. So we did away with an expensive real-time operating system. We wrote a two and a half thousand line hypervisor, which runs uh, 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 with the, the Intel primitives, uh, can guarantee sufficient determinism at the CAST uh, 32 level. Uh, we run our application in multiple partitions, which are time slices bound to a single core. The primitives that Intel brings uh, gu guarantee non-contention when these things communicate, and it's a very nice environment to run other otherwise bare metal. Uh, so this, you know, you can entirely cover with DO178C standards, the, the, the type that fans can, can teach you all about. And then if we go to the next slide, the, uh, the, the Tiger Lake, packs uh, quite a punch when it comes to uh, um, uh, computational power, but we are pushing four camera streams of 12 uh, gigapixels, sorry, 12 megapixels times 20 frames per second. So that's a lot of pixels. Uh, so we need about a tera op uh, per second per camera stream. And that's, you know, even for the Tiger Lake, that's, uh, that's on the edge of what's possible. So we took um, uh, an, an open source architecture on the internet called the uh, Apache TVM, 
And we uh, uh, took a component called the Versatile Tensor Accelerator, which is a specification for an architecture. And we implemented that in Verilog um, so that we can do the pixel level uh, AI computation, the machine learning computation in, in the FPGA. And that's entirely coverable with DO254, also something that Vance can tell you all about. Uh, so if we now go to the next one, uh, so at the system level, you know, you have to meet these requirements of the system that it's fit for purpose and that it's safe. And uh, for DAA, there's a couple of uh, relevant standards. Uh, DO365 uh, is a general one for the Technovoid systems. Uh, 366 goes into detail for radars. DO387, it still says XXX here because this is a rather old slide, uh, tries to transliterate the radar mops into uh, uh, electro-optical mops. And we can design to that standard. But now if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, this should also be a familiar figure for those who take uh, Vance's course. So the, at, the, at the bottom level, that your hardware is safe and that your, your software is written correctly, um, that's all very nice. But it doesn't show that the machine learned component does what it's supposed to do. So Vance talks, Vance talks a lot about determinism. And we, we've had some conversation about that. I, I don't think that determinism is exactly the right word. but uh, the thing is, these neural networks that we use, they have an emergent behavior. Uh, for example, so we feed it a camera image and it draws a box around the aircraft that's in the air. And so how do you know it does that right? And how do, do you know it does that right all the time? It doesn't do it right all the time. It does, actually, for an arbitrary image that we gather, we get it right, say, 96% of the time. And that's quite a long ways away from the 10 to the minus whatever that you're used to in aerospace. So if we go to the next slide, uh, in 2017, we went to EASA and we said, what if we showed up with a piece of avionics that has a neural network in it? And they said, we would tell you to go away. So we came back a year later after, after they told us, go do some more homework. So we came back a year later with having done some more homework with, you know, we think we have a way to uh, reason about this. And it's not, you know, proving determinism in the little bits in the millions of weights in the network, but it's uh, arguing about the safety of the system at a statistical and a holistic level. So out of that uh, work came uh, a study called Concept of Design Assurance for Neural Networks. Uh, it introduced the W shape. That was a joint work by uh, the EASA experts on this project uh, and ourselves. And um, uh, after that, if we can have the next slide. Uh, oh, I went ahead of myself. That was the first concept of design assurance. <laughs> uh, after this one, so it's about 130 pages um, that we uh, published 90% uh, of, uh, and it uses visual landing guidance as the as the uh, as the example to work through. And now we can go to the next one because after that we did the second concept of design assurance for neural networks number two, where we worked uh, in more detail through some open questions uh, about this W shape and what does it mean for the visual traffic detection. And then finally, and uh, if we go to the next slide, this, this happened yesterday. Uh, we did a project with the FAA uh, in 2021, uh, between November 2020 and November 2021. Uh, and yesterday that was published on the FAA website, hooray! Uh, and it uh, again went back to the visual landing uh, system uh, based on a neural network where we uh, had a flight test campaign uh, in Florida with uh, flight test engineers from the FAA and we worked through this W shape in, um, in a practical case of, uh, of a, you know, a toy system with a limited scope, but you know, nevertheless a real safety critical uh, application. And in the meantime, we've also kicked off an STC project uh, with the FAA together with a partner, Avidyne, who are the formal applicants, um, uh, to get the, the Technovoid system to market. We announced that last year at Oshkosh. So now I hope I have one minute to actually talk about W shape. <laughs> and because, you know, I've, I've talked, I've given a lot of context. Can I have the next slide, uh, Vance? Uh, right, so this w, what is this magical W shape about? So Vance showed you the V. Uh, so normally you write down very precisely what your system is supposed to do, and then you write down how, you, how are you going to do that in the low level requirements, and you write your code, and then you test, and then you test that the low level requirements are implemented in the high level and system requirements, and you check that it all uh, follows, uh, follows this process. With machine learning, instead of locking a couple of uh, software engineers in a room with the requirements and waiting until you know, they pass the verification, you have one computer algorithm called the machine learning algorithm exploit all the settings in a large parameter space 
of uh, uh, another computer program called the model. And this fiddling of the knobs produces something that hopefully, acceptably solves your problem uh, in a statistic way. And uh, the machine learning algorithm takes uh, large data sets of examples uh, to tweak this, uh, this algorithm. And it also uses a separate data set called the, uh, the verification set to check that it actually works as advertised. And this check, this verification step is a statistical argument. And now the requirements you have for your system become statistical requirements on the data set you use for learning and for uh, validating your system. And that means that a lot of the requirements go from uh, the system, they go into your data set, and how you handle your data set, how you run the machine learning algorithm. And then once you have your model, you have to go and implement it uh, in your box and, and show that it still works as advertised and that you did everything properly. So EASA contributed this extra hump in the, in the V, which uh, clarifies it all, but really it's a mnemonic of this process. And uh, so by now we have three reports of uh, 130 pages each uh, out there in the public domain uh, or out in the public. Uh, and uh, I hope to uh, preach this gospel um, uh, in the coming years. And in the meantime, we are working with the uh, regulators on both sides of the ocean to get uh, products out there that use this uh, to show that it is actually, in fact, possible to apply a machine learning component in a safety critical setup. And I think that is my allotted time. So I'm going to hand over to Gabi from Intel, who will talk about the hardware you need to run all this good stuff. Hey, everybody. Um, Very good. <laughs> so hi, everybody. I'm Gabby. So um, today I'm going to be discussing um, using Intel technology in safety critical avionics. Um, so if you, without further ado, if you want to go to the next slide, Vance. So um, these are just some of our notices and disclaimers. Um, if you just want to take a quick glance at these. Um, and we can kind of just jump right into the content. So Vance, if you want to can pull up the next slide, great. So um, the Intel Airworthiness Evidence Package is available for license under NDA, and it accelerates, it helps accelerate the time to um, certification, and it contains data that we don't normally offer to customers. Um, so basically, the Intel AAP enables you to build your certification packages for the full hardware and software stack which is the foundation for safety critical applications. So in the following slides, we will discuss the content of the AEP, as well as we will touch on how Intel's time-coordinated computing um, technologies enhance deterministic performance within and beyond the Intel processors. So on this slide, um, you know, what we kind of wanted to capture is that looking across an aircraft, um, not all subsystems demand the same level of performance. Intel processors are able to scale in size, weight, performance, and cost to meet the demanding needs of modern avionics subsystems. And each subsystem aboard an aircraft, aboard an aircraft is um, categorized relative to its influence on the safe operation of the overall aircraft. Um, the Intel AEP specifically um, provides data to help avionics manufacturers and system integrators achieve um, DAL certification from DAL-A through DAL-D. Um, Intel processors also deliver significant advantages for avionics um, as they have been built for industrial use conditions. Um, select IOTG SKUs target aviation applications and have been designed to meet real-time and functional safety requirements. Critical use conditions also include um, a long life of parts, um, you know, seven to 15 years for some parts, um, and support for extended temperature ranges and high performance in a single package. Um, all this to say, again, um, the AP helps accelerate time to market, and the data alleviates the need to kind of do your own characterization because Intel is providing the characterization that we developed while creating the part. Um, so next slide. So Intel Core processors um, are powering the certifiable AI roadmap. So the Intel processor graphics IRIS XELP architecture with the integrated AI acceleration and high performance cores provide customers with the ability to power their AI workloads. 
Um, the architecture is uniquely positioned to help users simultaneously um, unleash the compute performance of all system silicon, silicon on complex AI workloads. So um, specifically what we'll speak to in the future um, coming up, kind of setting the stage for that, is the 11th gen Intel Core processors deliver accelerated AI in inferencing and computer vision with parallel in parallel with other core functions. Um, the integrated Intel Deep Learning Boost um, vector, vector Neural Network Instructions, um, VNNI, deliver a significant performance improvement by combining three instructions into one, resulting in maximizing the use of compute resources, better cache utilization, and avoiding potential bandwidth bottlenecks. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, Intel includes um, detailed information around both our silicon development process and our system integration milestones in the Intel AEP. So this data provides insight into the processes Intel follows to ensure the quality of our silicon, microcode, and firmware. Um, we also provide a collection of data to help um, with your supplier selection criteria, including information about conflict, min our com conflict minerals policy and um, reach compliance and ESD protection. Um, once we have an NDA in place, customers have access to Intel's resource, design, resource and Design Center, which provides technical documentation, software, and tools for designing and building with Intel products. Um, the Resource Design Center is where you'll find all of the latest design specifications, um, errata sheets, um, field siting reports, and Intel also maintains a dedicated site for product change notifications and product discontinuance notifications. Um, so next slide. So um, the Intel AP also includes documentation with recommendations for designing system level mitigations, um, such as our CAS32A guide, which describes the tuning for real-time applications, including hardware, BIOS, um, OS, network, and um, applications consistent with um, AMC 2193. Um, dependent failure analysis um, is performed also to identify single events or single causes that could result in the failure of two or more components or result in cascading failures to which violates the safety requirements. Um, the freedom from interference analysis is performed to determine whether faults in components with um, less critical um, DAL can influence components with a more critical DAL. Um, and the failure modes and effects, failure modes, effects, and diagnostic analysis um, contains the results of our analysis to anticipate failure during the design stage by identifying the possible failures in a design or manufacturing process. Um, further, it evaluates um, mitigation measures in place and mi mitigation measures in place um, added in order to achieve um, the required sa safety integrity. Um, so next slide, please. So um, Intel real-time technology supports new solutions that um, require a high degree of coordination, both within and across devices. Um, in <clears throat> Intel Time Com Coordinated Computing, which from here on I'll just refer to it as TCC, Intel TCC, um, enabled processors deliver optimal compute and time performance for real-time applications on select SKUs. Um, pair these processors with Intel Ethernet controllers featuring IEEE um, 802.1 time-sensitive networking support or with any other number of popular networking devices and you can power um, complex real-time systems. Determinism and time-sensitive networking are key for multiple systems working together in an aircraft. Um, Intel's real-time computing performance and solutions are focused on use cases where missing a deadline is a system failure. Um, real-time offerings from Intel support new solutions that deliver both high compute and real-time performance by prioritizing real-time workloads, um, access to cache memory and networking, minimizing disruptions from other workloads, um, optimizing performance for both real-time and non-real-time workloads, and ensuring availability in both native and virtualized environments. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide, Vance. Thank you. 
So um, just to kind of speak to the 11th gen um, Intel Core processor family, um, also known as Tiger Lake, as Vance kind of touched on a bit earlier, um, we have specifically a chip designed for the avionics market that has thermal throttling disabled to allow for greater determinism. And this integrated GPU allows you to offload um, your AI workloads. Um, we will have a DAL A package available for this at the end of quarter two, um, but there is a strong focus on um, assisting the rack with development and um, addressing the growing complexity of IOTG infrastructures um, and helping to support um, avionics applications. Um, so next slide. So um, if you would like to learn more um, about how Intel can help um, enable our worthiness certification, um, you know, we've included um, some links to our um, links to um, our solution brief as well as our digital transformation solutions, um, which you can obviously use the QR code or the um, link there to access. Um, also, Debbie Aubrey, um, who will also be on this, who is also on this um, webinar, um, is our main point of contact for this. And she would be happy to answer any questions if you shoot her an email. Um, so next slide. And so I believe we have arrived at the Q&A portion. I guess I can hand it back to Vance now to facilitate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gabby. Wow, Luke, Gabby, Gabby no that was fantastic. I'm very, very impressed. Bravo, bravo. A lot of technical meat and a lot of good takeaways in that, that presentation. Wow. OK, we do have questions from the audience and folks. Your questions are coming in. Please go ahead and uh, take the time if you'd like and give us some more questions. I'll read the questions out loud and suggest who I think the intended recipient of that is. Uh, let's see, question number one. I think this is for Intel. Uh, Gabby and Deborah, how does the Intel Airworthiness Evidence Package help in actually certifying artificial intelligence machine learning? Um, I, I can take this one, Debbie. So um, with the Intel Silicon, first of all, you get higher performance um, per, per core, allowing for you to simplify your design with fewer parts using fewer cores while achieving um, target performance. Um, Intel also provides access to reliability data, such as FIT rates, dependent failures, and single effect analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, to increase um, confidence that the processor is reliable. Um, we also provide um, real-time tuning guides and a CAS32A guide, which helps you um, optimize the deterministic behaviors of the cores within the SOC. Um, so basically, silicon performance, reliability, and um, increased determinism. Debbie, I don't know if you want to add on to that or if that feels sufficient. Oh, that's oh. good. Yep. Thank okay, you. excellent. And we have another one. This one's a, a very detailed one, I think, for, for Luke at the lab. Luke, terrific presentation, by the way. Folks, Luke is very modest and humble, very smart guy. He's also a PhD, so it definitely uh, is time for this question. Luke, uh, with well, respect I'm to neural modest about it. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, uh, Jason, uh, one of our attendees, asked, uh, with respect to neural network based uh, runway landing guidance for general aviation auto land, if possible, could you discuss the 94% success certainty uncertainty aspect? And how important was that for the certifying agency to have a good understanding of the prob uh, probabilistic uncertainty that remains even after following EASA's uh, design assurance level guidance and activities? Right. So, so this is that was actually that was very much the the focus of this study. Um, so, for uh, um, uh, these type of machine learning systems, I would say that determinism it's a bit of a red herring. It, well, determinism means something else for aerospace people. So, in for physicists, determinism means same input, same output uh, at 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 the physical level. And if you show a camera the same images pixel for pixel, you know the system will produce bit for bit the same output. The problem is. 
So in that sense, it's deterministic. But the uncertainties in the input, the, the probability that you have two identical pictures, you know, in the lifetime of the system is nil because there are very, very, very many possible pictures, and you have to show that your coverage of the um, uh, of the space of all possible pictures is good enough to make these guarantees. And then, indeed, in a single case, you know, you may have 94% accuracy on uh, given a single image for the where do we find a runway. Say 6% of the time we don't do that uh, good enough. Um, and this, this is comparable with uh, no, a human reading a handwritten digit. So the world record for that is uh, for a machine learned system is 97% accurate on, on some data set or maybe 98. You know, it's a far cry from 10 to the minus something. So how do you deal with this? First of all, you build the system so that it can it is designed to deal with this 6% failure rate by having it raised to a sufficiently high power that it becomes a very small number again. Um, so for example, it would be crazy to you know fly around, take one image, and then land somewhere because one in 25 times we would have a disastrously bad landing. So what happens in fact is that when you approach, you take picture, 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 and you see your confidence that you are seeing the runway properly increase. So sometimes you will miss one, but as you get closer, you want to see this uh, probability getting higher. And the probability of that not happening is significantly smaller than this 94%. So the first ingredient is that you design your system at a level where it can deal with this uncertainty in an environment and the resulting uncertainty of the performance of the single component uh, by adding a component that over time integrates this to an acceptable level. Then the second very important ingredient in the certification of all of this is that you show that the 96 or the 94% is actually 94%. Um, so not that, for example, when it starts raining, it plummets to a 10% probability of getting it right, because that, then you would have a disaster in the making. And for that, you need to properly cheat your data. And you need to properly uh, draw your uh, random samples. Again, random is a, is a word that means something completely different in aerospace certification as for you know, academics reasoning about machine learning. But if you properly sample from reality, you have reason to believe that your 96% is actually 96% when you go out and fly. But you have to do work to do that. And that type of work is the same type of assurance that you used to do on you know, showing that your software is properly designed. So in the end, formal methods only get you so far. And you have a story by humans for humans that is adequately designed. And in the case of machine learning system, uh, a lot of that goes into how you treat your data. And that was very, very important for the FAA and you know, the point of the whole exercise. So thanks for asking the question. Terrific. Thank you very much, Luke. Excellent. Yeah, and we have a question on DO-178. Uh, will DO-178D, the next version we're on 178C now, will 178D address machine learning AI? You know, we don't think so. We think it's going to be handled by a supplement, much the way we do with CAS 32A or uh, advisory circular AMC 2193 multi-core. We think it's best to make it separate because it's going to affect hardware folks, ground systems, DO254, DO278. It's going to affect IMA, uh, formal methods for sure with AI. So best to have a supplement instead of making the 178C document even bigger. One of the beauties of 178C is that it's pretty compact, okay? It really makes it fairly readable. Let's see, uh, next question, uh, Intel. How does the Intel time-coordinated computing uh, technologies enhance deterministic performance? Um, I, I can field this one as well. So um, the Intel um, TCC time synchronization, um, first of all, provides a hardware mechanism to coordinate the various clocks found in individual IP blocks, um, while the Intel TCC timeliness provides a hardware mechanism to specify latency of data packets from one functional block to another. And the time-sensitive networking provides bounded maximum latency for scheduled traffic through switched Ethernet networks. Um, so time-sensitive networking um, is a set of IEEE um, 802 standards which that are defined um, by the IEEE TSN task group. And these standards help enable um, ultra-reliable and low-latency communication over Ethernet to support time-sensitive applications and deterministic behavior. 
So um, in short, TSN achieves this by using um, time, synchroniza time synchronization and traffic scheduling. Very good. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabby. Oh, Luke, this one's for you. Uh, Charles asks, I just learned about initiatives and explainable artificial intelligence. Will this be certifiable? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked because I, uh, three weeks ago, uh, leading up to the AUVSI conference, I wrote a series of six or seven blog posts on this whole explainability bandwagon. And it is my conviction that it is, uh, there's a couple of misconceptions there are stacked on each other, leading to people to believe that if only we had explainable AI, you know, then we could do the DO178C thing where we chase the requirements uh, and thereby adding this magic, magic explainability source makes the system traceable from low level to high level requirements and problem solved in our certifiable AI. So there's a couple of reasons why I believe that that's a fallacy. Um, and uh, the main one is that it does not address the system level uncertainty you have. So you know, you're trying to generate a level of certainty with these explanations that is not actually there. And it's not the fault of the system, it's the fault of the problem. So we are applying these uh, systems to solve the kind of problems that currently are not solved by avionics at all. So they're solved by people who have eyes in the visual cortex, like, you know, is there a runway here or where is the runway here? And that's inherently a problem that comes with a lot more uncertainty than do I have weight on wheels? Can I engage the thrust reverser? You know, it's a couple of bits in, a couple of bits out. This is uh, 12 megapixels uh, in and uh, a couple of uh, floating point numbers out. So um, to try to just explain what goes on in the neural network at the level of the individual number, the millions of parameters, you know, I'm going to say this is 4.73 because um, uh, of this, that's the wrong level of looking at it. I, I compare it to explaining the balance sheet of a company by looking at the paper and the ink that's used to print it, or to explain the quality of a dish by looking at uh, the tablecloth and the, uh, and the plate that you're looking at. So these are important ingredients, but they don't actually help with, with, with explaining uh, what's going on. So I think that uh, explainability methods are um, misguided and uh, will not actually bring um, uh, the, the desired clarity uh, and certifiability. Another thing that uh, irks me about the explainability bandwagon is that people always carefully avoid defining what constitutes a valid explanation. And that means that you can get unlimited funds from governments to do research, you know, produce papers that go absolutely nowhere and get you nowhere closer to proving that your system is fit for purpose or has unintended consequences. So uh, to answer your question briefly, I don't think that's gonna help. I hope I answered your question. You did with veracity, that was terrific, Lou. We have a, a, a simpler question, I think, for Intel from John. John asks, is the Intel evidence package, is it subscription or purchase? Gabby or Debbie, you want to take that one? Um, I will take that one. And hi, uh, my name's Deborah Aubrey. I'm the market development manager for um, the Federal and Aerospace Business Unit, which is part of the Internet of Things group here at Intel. Um, so the AEP, we have uh, the license structure is. Um, there is an upfront fee, which allows you access to the data that we have collected. Um, the data is available through our resource and design center website. Uh, we create a dedicated collection just for your company. So only your company would have access to that data once we um, have the agreements in place and the NDA is signed. So there is an access fee for the upfront. Um, um, access to that data. And then we also charge a, a unit fee, a per chip fee, uh, once you get to production. So there's two pieces to the licensing. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Dale. Yeah. Great presentation, too. Um, Luke, uh, Simon asks, uh, Luke mentioned artificial intelligence as running on the FPGA, then what functions are running on the CPU. You want to take that one, Luke? 
I want to unmute before I uh, start talking, and now I will repeat the sentence I started saying 30 seconds ago. Um, the uh, FPGA does the lower levels of the neural network, so the really the pixel levels, and if you get higher up, these neural networks become, become smaller, and the top of the networks we can run on the GPU in floating point, and we can run them on uh, the cores, which also have quite some oomph to do uh, quantized networks. So um, mainly the, the 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 CPU cores run the the overhead the orchestration um, and the the classical algorithms um, and then part of the you know if I think if we only have one camera we could probably pull it off with uh, with one Tiger Lake uh, we are working on on optimizing that further but um, in reality if we have more power we would just do more things you know you know how software people are they always you know piss away all the all the great performance gains that your hardware people make. So you have to be you have to be careful not to give them too much. Um, but uh, so we have some headroom in the Tiger Lake as is uh, for 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 other functions. Also, our VXP is going to do all three functions at the, all three functions with four cameras at the same time. Um, so it runs all these algorithms in uh, and and but they're orch orchestrated as classical real time um, uh, components where the the FPGA does the the bottom layer of the neural networks. I hope I hope I answered your question. Very good, Luke. I think you did. Thanks so much. And we have a question from Ria. Is the certification process planned to take place real time during the deployment stage as well as during model construction? I'll go ahead and take that one. You know, it's interesting. Certification is actually a complete real time involved activity that's done starting from the planning process during development, during model deployment, during model assessment, verification, and then the actual post facto testing. So we believe we need to prevent defects as much as possible. And most of the activities are on prevention, but since we can't guarantee that, we have to also use detection, which is meant to assess, do I still have any defects? And that's really as important during uh, AI machine learning. So it's gonna be a continuous process. We cannot build quality in, Testing itself doesn't directly improve quality, it assesses quality. So development assurance is about the process of development, which includes the learning, okay? And then we've got time for two, uh, two more questions. Let's see, one for Intel here. Um, Martin asks, virtualization, is that already used in aviation for safety today or, or is it certifiable? Hi. So. I think the answer is it's almost there. So today when we're talking to customers, they aren't there aren't very many customers that are um, looking at using hypervisors and a virtualized solution. Um, many customers are looking or are, are gonna take our four core part, our our eleventh gen core i7 part, and they're gonna lock down all but one of the processors. And what we're trying to do is help the industry understand. Um, that with the proper, you know, certifiable hypervisors in place, you can actually take advantage of the multi-core processors in order to run mixed criticality workloads, for example, and still have a certifiable system. So there are some um, hypervisors available commercially. Uh, we are working with uh, Wind River and Green Hills. Uh, we're working with Lynx Technology and DDCI um, with their Deos uh, operating system. So there's a number of different RTOS vendors um, who do have uh, certifiable hypervisors available as part of their software stack. Very nice, Deb. Terrific answer. Well, a, lot, a lot of value. Luke, uh, last questions for you, my friend, on AI from Simon. Does your system fuse data, Luke, from other sensors, for example, radar, LIDAR, and static data, such as maps, to build confidence? Yes, it, that's exactly what it does. Because, so, there are two different versions. So, we have a demonstrator system, which is meant to show, you know, what you can do with just, just one eye or just two eyes. And, uh, you know, we want to show how well you can position it without using GPS. So, you know, we record the GPS side by side. But in the production system, obviously, you know, when you have GPS, it'd be crazy not to use it. Um, but we've designed the system such that if the GPS is unreliable, you know, the vision system will be able to tell. 
And because, you know, if you have experience flying over Utah with the me, uh, a NOTAM that says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, today no, no GPS over Utah, you know, you can't have your robot fleet, you know, avoid Utah because somebody decided to switch it off for today. Um, so uh, same with the detect and avoid. When we show the videos, it's just the camera. Uh, the production system that we're building with Avidyne that we put out under the brand name Pilot Eye, it takes uh, ADS-B and Flarm if you're in Europe or if you want it, and it deduplicates that and shows one symbol, and it will come from uh, either of the sensors. And um, so the the fusion is uh, the fusion is a very classical algorithm also. So, um, but it definitely helps to get your epsilon smaller and your uh, your proof of fitness uh, higher. Very good question. Very good, Luke. Well, folks, we're out of time. We are going to make the recording available to you. You'll get a notice of that early next week. So watch your inbox Monday, Tuesday, and I'm sure Intel and Dalian will follow up as well. Luke Van Dyke, sir, thank you very much for contributing great knowledge. And Gabby and yeah, Deborah from Intel, wow, uh, hitting it out of the park with the great Intel capabilities. Looking forward to seeing a lot more Intel and data land when we fly. I'm in the airplane tomorrow once again. So. Thank you very much, Thanks everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank sure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bye bye. Bye bye.